Good morning. Happy Friday and happy Lunar New Year to those who are celebrating. Um, welcome to another installment of MBF Biosciences TJIF webinar series or TJ's Information Friday. If, <laughs> if this is your first time joining us, my name is TJ Tatro. I work here in the MBF Labs group. I've done a lot of these introductions, so I'll, I'll keep it short and leave it there. Thank you for joining me today for our second iteration of optimizing dendritic spine detection and classification. It's quite a mouthful. I've decided to keep the same topic as last time so that we can dive a little deeper and really dig into the questions that you all have. I have a couple of short pieces that I'd like to mention at the top of the webinar, but during that time, please feel free to submit your questions, um, whether it's something relating to your research or something that you're curious about regarding spine detection or classification. My goal for today's installment is to treat it more like a question and answer session rather than a one-sided presentation. In the previous installment, I did cover a couple of topics like working with the Golgi filter in Neurolucida 360, detecting spines on Golgi stained images, the automatic classification of spines, and how to alter those classification criteria. I'd be more than happy to dive back into those topics and, and get a little more um, detailed in that manner. However, we do have that webinar recorded and it is available to watch at your leisure. So if you do have questions about that, please feel free to, to write in and ask those. If you wanna refer back to the old webinar, that works just as well. Without further delay, let's quickly cover how you can submit some questions. When you develop a question during the webinar, please send it in. Submitting a question is as easy as clicking the orange arrow button as you see here to expand that go to webinar panel out find that questions portion i guess and then type in your question and click send it's as easy as that if there are topics like i had mentioned that you'd like to see covered or questions relating specifically to your research please don't hesitate to ask and this is a great um, a great question to start how can i access the old webinar recordings this is perfect um, the best way to access those, in my opinion, you can go to YouTube and type in MBF Bioscience, and we are the only MBF Bioscience. Uh, you can you can go and check out all of our previous webinars. We have a lot on there, dating back to even 2017. We have a couple with Derek Dickstein, and we have them ranging from the very start of uh, Neurolucida and Stereo Investigator to other programs that we have, and then pushing all the way towards the current products and the more recently released products like Microdynamics, NeuroInfo, and of course, Neurolucida 360. So if you'd like to go and access those, it, they are available on YouTube. They are also available via the MBF Bioscience website. Um, so, so those are two options that you have for accessing old webinar questions. So thank you, thank you for asking that one. Uh, lastly, as I had mentioned in, in many other webinars, but this one is also being recorded and it will be available to view later. And a link of that webinar, of this webinar, will be sent to you in an email. We're also gonna be putting it up on the different social media platforms um, so that that will be available, or links will be available to access the recording as well. With that being said, let's get started. The first thing that I wanted to show today is kind of the reverse of how we've been working in general. Typically, I'd start off by showing you Neurolucida 360, doing a reconstruction, and then opening that reconstruction in Neurolucida Explorer, which we have open here. Neurolucida Explorer is the, the sister product or the, the partnering product of Neurolucida 360, and this is where we do all of our quantitative analyses, and this is where we get all of our reports. So, as you can see on my screen, I do have a reconstruction. This is a nice neuron that is from, I believe, Javier Di Felipe. So thank you for letting us use this. With this neuron, we have a lot of intricacies. We have many different branching points. We have thousands of dendritic spines, and even the soma itself is a little bit complex. So there's a lot that we can dive into here. The important thing that I wanna start with first, and something that we get a lot of questions on typically, is how to run the Scholl analysis. So to do that, 
there's a couple of different ways, but the most important thing to know is that you need to have a SOMA to run the Scholl analysis. Whether you have a full SOMA like we have here, whether it's a partially imaged SOMA, or even a 2D SOMA if you're taking a simple uh, maximum resolution picture rather than an entire stack, all of those are viable. And I'll go into a little bit more detail with the partial SOMA and the 2D, but it's important that you have a SOMA. We need to be able to create a centroid for that shoal analysis so that we can start building the shells out around it. So we can use the select all button or we can use the traced structures tab here on the left side. That's going to be made available under this view tab and then traced structures. So selecting all of our, our objects, we can highlight them here, or we can use the select all button in this 3D window. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna select all right here, and then I'm gonna go to analyze, spatial, and shoal analysis. Uh, just to start, I'm gonna change the color here to orange, so it's a little bit easier to distinguish than, than that dark blue. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna keep these settings the, the same at the default. From here, I can click display and we'll get a number of, of columns and rows. I'm gonna shrink this down since we don't have any varicosities, other or detached or even branched spines that have been classified for us. I'll, I'll go over some of those other options in a little bit, but just note that we do have all of our information here based on those radial increments that we've provided in that settings menu. We, we chose a distance of 10 microns, so I'm gonna shrink this down by pulling my mouse wheel backwards to zoom out. And you'll notice that as I click and drag my left mouse button to rotate, the shoal shells all remain in that same kind of space. And so that's showing us and providing the information that this is a 3D model um, and that we are working in all three dimensions. So the way that the shoal analysis works, we have our initial shell here, and then we're gonna build out in 10 micron radial increments. So we can see the number of intersections between the, the 10 micron radius mark and how many times there's a branch that intersects with that. And then we also have a number of different data points that we can touch on here, including the number of spines and endings, which is also a really nice thing to be aware of. If we want to focus more on uh, larger groups rather than these small clusters, I can close this. I'm gonna remove the analysis graphics. This is just nice to kind of clear the visual space. It's the second to last icon in this analyze ribbon. That's just gonna remove that shoal shell that we've placed initially. And because everything has been deselected, I'm gonna go back to view. I'll select all once more, and then I can return to analyze, spatial, and shoal analysis. This time, I'm gonna leave the starting radius at 10. That seemed to encapsulate the SOMA pretty well. But this time, I'm gonna change the radial increment to a radius increment to 100. I'll choose dendrites once more and I'm gonna click display. Now we can see we have the same columns, but the amount of rows is a little different. We have six rows, if I move this down, seven rows, pardon me. Um, but now as I zoom out, we can see that those, those radius circles are a little bit further apart, but it's still keeping the same kind of 3D structure. <clears throat> Again, as we click, we can see which, which radius is being selected and which kind of grouping we're working with. So it's a nice way that you can bounce back and forth. You can really fine tune and bin what you are interested in within that shoal analysis. And as always, when you have your data table open, you can always export this to Excel to do further analyses like bar graphs, pivot tables, further averaging, whatever you see put. Um, you can, you can do that in Microsoft Excel by clicking this current Windows button. Um, so from here, I'm gonna close this table down. And what I wanna show now is, I'm gonna remove the graphic again. I'm gonna go to view and I'm gonna reset the orientation. I'm gonna center it back on our neuron. Something that has been brought up recently is the density 
of the spines. People want to know what what the density per micron is of the spines on the branch. And so that's another thing that's easily done. Depending on what you want to look at, if you want to look at an individual branch structure itself, we can click on that here in this 3D window. Let me zoom in so I can get the full thing. We can click on the branch and it's going to show us which branch we're working with. Um, but if you want to look at all of the branches at once, it's easy enough just to click this dendrites option in your trace structures menu. I'm going to hold down control and click the spines button as well, or option. And so now we have everything other than the soma selected. That's, that's quite all right for this. I'm going to go to analyze, structure, and branch structure again. And this time, however, I'm going to go to spines and dendrite spines. We don't need all the details right now. We're just curious about these, the, pardon me. <laughs> we just care about the density. Um, so I'm just going to shrink this down so we can see it once more. And I'm going to rotate it so that we can look at everything at once really nicely. <clears throat> So with, with this data table that we have now, we have all of the different classifications, and then we have the density per micron. And this quantity measurement here is based on the branch ordering. This is not based on the branches themselves. That's something that we're looking to implement very soon, is to be able to allow the user to look at the individual branches in this kind of overarching data set. So as I was saying, Quantity one is based on all of the primary branch ordering uh, segments rather than, than, the, than the whole branch. So working through, we have the secondary, tertiary, fourth, fifth, et cetera. Um, but the important thing to know here is that because this is based off of the branch ordering structure, we need to ensure that these branches are being structured properly. And what I mean by that is, if I close this data table down, we'll remember that it's all in the branch order. When I go to view, we do have an option to color by branch order. So when I click this, it's gonna switch from all the, the original colors we had and, and label it as the branch structure. I'm gonna reset the orientation so we can really look at it in a, a zoomed in focus. And when I click this navigate by branch order button, it's the third one in on the view tab, it's gonna show down here in the bottom of this 3D window that the primary branches are gonna be this nice lime green color. So it looks like we have a couple here, but as I move up, when I go to the top of the view section, I'll click up and now the secondary will be in red. So we can see here that it goes from green to red. So this is properly labeled. But this one looks like it's mislabeled. And these don't even have the, the right green color to start. So what that's really indicating is that most likely what we're seeing is that whoever reconstructed this, when they started tracing it, it started from the bottom here and worked up until we got to this section. So this branch is gonna be considered the primary branch and this would be the secondary. And that's going to throw off the, the density measurement for that primary branch, which would be quantity one, referring back to that old data table. So the way that we can remedy this, I'm going to close down Neurolucida Explorer here, and then I'm going to open up Neurolucida 360. We have the same data here, the same data file. And what I'm going to do, I'll make this full screen so everyone can see it nice and easily. I'm going to go to tree. I'm going to go to edit, and the last thing is this points mode. It's going to display every single point that's that's been created for this data file. And now we can see, let's go back to the one that was properly done. So this yellow branch here, I'm going to use this pivot point icon to select the SOMA, and now we're just going to rotate around that SOMA. So here, I'm going to turn off the pivot point once more, and when I click on this point, We'll give it just a second to catch up. When I click on this point, let's see. Okay. For some reason, I'm I can't click on the right points. So let uh, the program is just thinking. We'll we'll come back to this. There we go. 
odd. Um, let me try one more thing. I'll try clicking off and we'll try points mode once more. But basically what we're going to do here, here we go, is the directionality. We want to set this up so that the final point closest to the soma is going to be set as the origin. That's going to flip our entire tree structure. So now this is going to become the primary. And I'm going to do that with all of these. So that way we have a nice proper data set. Um, this may seem a little cumbersome, but it, it, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we have to do to ensure that the data set is going to be represented properly. Um, this isn't necessary for every single time that you're reconstructing, but it is important to know that depending on how you're reconstructing, you might already have the origin point closest to the soma, or you might have it further away, closer to a terminal, um, something like this. So it's always great to double check and make sure that that the data that you're working with is being um, kind of recorded properly and that that all the information embedded within that data is being stored properly. So I'm opening Neurolucida Explorer once more by using this save and view button over here in the 3D window. It's opening on my other screen right now, so I'll bring that over in just a quick second. We're just loading in all 8,268 spines. Um, so it's, it's quite a lot, but we should be able to see that in just a second. There we go. So it looks the same on the outside, but the data structure has changed on the inside. If I click this color by branch order once more, we should see the greens are all closest to the soma, followed by the red, the pink, the blue, and then the dark blue. So when I navigate by branch order once more, I can move up and we can see the secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and then fifth, sixth, seventh, et cetera. So now when I go back to analyze and I do these, the spine density measurement, it's gonna be different, but it's gonna be more accurate. Um, and so again, when that's being done, now we can see that the density has changed, the quantity has changed, and so now we're reporting more accurately. Um, Bruce is asking, if the neuron was traced from the soma each time, this step would not be necessary. That's correct. So if, let me return to um, Neurolucid Explorer, or 360 real quickly, Bruce. So what what we're saying here is, if you're working with the uh, user guided mode and you start closest to the soma and then you trace outward, you're totally fine. That's gonna keep your origin point right at that soma. The only time that might be different is if you have multiple somas in the image and you're working with the automatic trace mode. In that sense, I highly recommend going into the, the points mode for editing and then just double checking and ensuring that the origin point is closest to the soma that the branch belongs to. Um, but 90% of the time, you're 100% correct. If you start your tracing closest to the soma each time, that step is kind of um, skipped over and there's no need to return. It's always nice to double check, but if you're tracing in that manner, you're all set and ready to rock and roll there. Um, let me return back to the Explorer program for one quick second. So I can explain the, uh, the, the, the Scholl analysis with 2D data and a partial SOMA. Unfortunately, we do, I don't have any data to show right now with a partial SOMA, but if we can imagine, let me turn off this color by branch order real quick. Um, there we go. If we can imagine that the 3D image is looks something like this, where our SOMA is, in the corner of our data, but we don't have the full SOMA, we can still run the Scholl analysis from here. But what we're gonna see is that the centroid of the SOMA is might not necessarily reflect the, the anatomy of the SOMA. What we're really, and, and that's a little convoluted in what I'm saying, but essentially what I'm getting down to is if we have a partial SOMA, we don't know where the rest of it is, so we can only work with the data that we're provided. So in this sense, the centroid is gonna be somewhere around where my mouse is now, rather than in the full SOMA, it might be somewhere a little bit further down.
if you have a partial soma, you can still run the shoal analysis. The centroid is just going to be a little bit off depending on what part of the soma is being imaged, but that's quite all right. With a 2D soma, the same thing is going to apply as this 3D. However, sometimes when we're working with 2D data, the the soma detection in 3D might not necessarily get the entirety of the soma. So, a way that we can remedy that is if I shrink down this 3D window, we do have a way to trace the soma in 2D. So when you're working with some 2D data, you can always, let me just move that image back up. You can always work in 2D by hitting this trace tab, clicking the neuron button, and then you have a cell body option here. In this sense, you're just gonna trace a contour around that 2D soma. And then when you right click, there's an option to end. So this is the dendrite. Let me click on cell body. If you right click, you can finish the cell body after you've done your tracing around and contouring it. That's gonna close the contour. And then when you get to your 3D environment, it's gonna allow uh, a nice kind of closed picture just like we see here. When you bring that into Neurolucida Explorer, the Scholl analysis will still be run and it's gonna find the centroid of that 2D soma. And then you can continue from there. A question that we had from, from last week that, or two weeks ago that I didn't have time to touch on, but I'd like to touch on now is how can we differentiate a stubby spine from the, the branch itself? So in this sense, let me bring up my data. I apologize, I didn't have that up already. I'm gonna use something that's a little bit more um, simple. So when we look at a data file, something like this, we can we can really see the the structure of the branch. Um, but when we trace the data, there's obviously going to be some blurring in Z. With that being said, it, it might be hard to differentiate, especially a stubby spine because they are so so small. Uh, let me clean this up just a little bit. My apologies. I'll run through it with that user guided mode. The reason we're seeing that is because we have quite a few seeds on on the data uh, where a spine would be rather than a branch. So let me fix this one thing and then I can get right back to what I was saying. My apologies. I'm a little hyper-focused in that sense. Okay, so we have our branch here. When I go to spine, we we have these three or four settings still. We have our outer range, our minimum height, which I have been misguiding people on for a little bit. It's It's not quite dependent on the base of the spine. What we're really looking at here is we're looking at what the minimum height of the spine is going to be. So we're looking at the touching point from the surface of the branch to the furthest possible point of the spine. That has to be larger than 0 0.3 microns. So taking that into account and then taking into account how the spines are being classified, that's a major way of how we can differentiate between what would be branch signal or a spine. So I'm gonna go ahead and detect all here. And then as I classify all, I'm just gonna quickly show the settings. <clears throat> so it looks like the green is gonna be our stubby. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, if I rotate. And I'm gonna look at this back one here. Um, with with this data, it's it's a little bit less difficult to distinguish between a Z blur in the background and what could potentially be a spine. With Golgi staining, this might be a little bit more difficult. So please, you can always refer back to the Golgi filter uh, webinar that we've done. The help page is written very well for the filters as well. So that's another resource that's available to you. And our technical support team is always available to, to go over some of this with you if you're having difficulty in distinguishing spines or detecting spines. With that being said, I'll dive a little bit deeper into the, the classification and how we can kind of justify the spine being detected and then the spine being classified. 
for something to be considered a stubby spine, first we're going to look at the head to neck ratio and whether it falls within this category. If the if the neck is not defined, meaning that it does not fit within this ratio, we're then going to move down to this length to head ratio of 2.5. If the aspect is not tall, so if once again it does not fall into that two and a half to one ratio of length to head, then it's going to be considered a stubby mushroom, or not a stubby mushroom, a stubby spine. My apologies. Um, so with these two criteria in play with this, this minimum height, we can really kind of verify that we're looking at a spine and more specifically a stubby spine rather than branch noise or branch signal. And one way that we can kind of verify that is I can clear all of these and I can raise this. I'm going to raise it up just ever so slightly by, by two tenths of a micron. I'm going to detect it again and we'll see that we have, um, I guess we have the same. Let me double that to six. And then now we'll see that we have a different number of spines. When I classify this time, we'll see that we don't have a single stubby spine on this data set. So what we're really seeing is that the settings here in play with the classification settings are really good and are doing a really nice job of, of thoroughly checking our data set. <clears throat> I'm going to... So, so that was more about ensuring your data is being properly, um, properly detected and worked with. We have a couple minutes left. Um, I'm going to leave this video up as, as people send in their questions. But as those come in, I just want to uh, point out that this is, again, a collaboration between uh, Dr. Eric Betzig and Dr. Ed Boyden. What, what I'm showing on the screen now is an example of expansion microscopy, and it shows the outcome of reconstructing a piece of tissue that's been isotropically expanded. In working with expansion microscopy, the researcher is enabled to collect information at the nanoscale while viewing it at what would be the microscale. And you can see as the video rotates and hides this traced data that you can see immense detail in the spines that would otherwise be missed if this technique weren't applied. So right here, we can see a lot of detail showing the, the spine neck and the, the spine head. So this is something that we were very happy to work with and very proud to kind of collaborate with them on. Um, it, it's an extraordinary feat what, what they've been able to do. And we, we kind of changed the algorithm and detection of our program to really be able to pick up on these more highly detailed images. Uh, let's see. It doesn't look like we have any questions that have come in so far. I'll wait just another minute or so, but if that is the case, then we can kind of progress from here and I'll, I'll take into account some of the questions you might have afterward or any any requests that you would have for future topics. Um, I'm more than happy to, to do that. How do I deal with more messy images? Danny, that is a, a fantastic question. Um, there's a couple of different ways that we can do that. When, when we think about messy images, it, it, there's, there's a couple of different distinctions that I want to make. One is, are we, are we talking more about the staining or are we talking about the imaging or both? Um, if that's the case, I mean, regardless of, of how we're going to define messy, we do have a couple of different options to kind of reduce the noise. Um, one is by going to this image tab and going to batch filter. We do have a couple of filters that will allow uh, kind of noise to be remedied. I'm going to, rather than choosing the image from here, I'm going to select from the computer. I'll select the same image we have open. And then I'm moving a little quickly, but under config, there's a little wrench icon that I can click to get the filter options. With Golgi staining specifically, we do have a filter for that. With in vivo, if you're taking a, a, an image live, an in vivo image, we do have something here that will kind of reduce the, 
the movement, if you will, of the of the animal as it's being imaged or kind of post imaging, obviously. But this is here to kind of reduce what would be a little bit more of that that noise and, and mess from being counted within the image itself. And then lastly, if neither of those really apply, there are a couple of different options to detect spines in the program. We do have, let me return, we do have three different ways or two and a half of detecting. One is just to simply click to detect the, the spine itself. So I can click on this empty spine where I see the signal. And then based on the signal strength itself, we'll get a reconstruction. We do have a checkbox to filter image noise if, if there is some noise within the image. And then lastly, I mean, building off of the other detections, we do have a detect all. And then this checkbox below is to detect on the nearest branch. So it's a more segmented automatic detection that will work per segment. The last thing that might be helpful is working with your image adjustment window. Um, this image adjustment window that I have open here can be found under the image panel and then under the adjust button. And this is going to adjust the image data itself, what we're looking at on the screen, as well as what the program and algorithms are going to detect as signal. So as we adjust, let me hide the tracing for a second. As I adjust my image, whether it's the black point, the white point, or the gamma setting in the center, I can bring this down and we can see in that 3D window a nice live transition of that being applied. So working with the gamma setting can sometimes reduce some of that mess. However, we do have a couple of different options. Like I mentioned, the black point, the white point, you can change the brightness or the contrast to really make sure that you're getting the most dynamic range of pixels in your image, as well as the most accurate reconstruction. Um, I'm a little bit over time, which is okay, um, but I am going to just quickly switch over back to that PowerPoint to finish up. If you do have other questions, um, feel free to submit them and we can use them for another question and answer topic uh, in the future. I do want to acknowledge that uh, we did get permission to use Javier Felipe, Eric Betzig, and Ed Boyden's images. I'd like to thank them as well. And lastly, we do have two upcoming webinars. Uh, our Spark team is presenting one using NeuroLucida 360 to annotate microscopy image data. And that's going to be on Tuesday, February 23rd. And then at the beginning of March, we do have one, um, I believe, with Chip Gerfin. And that would be compiling mouse brain volumes from whole slide images of serial sections. And that's going to be with our NeuroInfo program. Both are going to be extremely helpful. Um, and I welcome all of you guys to join. I know I'll be there. So as always, thank you so much for joining the webinar session. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate your attention. Thank you all and have a great weekend again.